And so this morning, we're going to really focus in on the, the fact that God not only created us, but that he created us, as he says, in his image. What does that mean? How is that significant? How does that literally change the way we view ourselves, the way that we change and should treat other people as well? And so we're going to look at a number of passages today, but we're going to start in Genesis 1 and the story of God's creation of mankind. And uh, so if you have a Bible, it's really easy to find page 1. And let me begin by reading Genesis 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I had given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And it was evening and morning, and it was the sixth day. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we do have to spend this time to worship you, to enjoy you, to celebrate what you're doing. And Father, now to be able to dive into your word. I thank you for the things that you continue to teach and challenge me. And Father, I pray now that your spirit would be here, that you would speak through me and even in spite of me. Father, help us to hear what your word has for us today, not only to grow in understanding, but Father, to grow in our application and living out these incredible truths. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've been looking in this early part of Genesis, and and we've seen that there's really two different stories about the origin of the universe, how it came into existence. One starts, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and so it begins in Genesis. And Genesis 1 then tells us how God created everything else that exists, and it, and it wraps up, in a sense, at the end of chapter 1, the verses we just read, where he talks about how he ended that creative work with the climax of creating man, mankind in his likeness. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him Male and female, he created him. That's a powerful story. On the other hand, there's another story that many people believe. That story starts, in the beginning, there was nothing. And from that nothing, there was a singularity that formed a small spot of nothingness in the midst of the nothingness. And somehow that singularity exploded with incredible force, creating all the matter in the universe. And it was an explosion that somehow brought order to matter. So it then organized itself into stars, into planets, and and ultimately into life that spontaneously appeared here on Earth. And and over time, that life, the single cell organism, somehow evolved through random mutations and through natural causes to to take that single cell life to to now create all the life that is on this world, including us ourselves. Now, that's two different stories each telling a really different account of the creation of the universe, of where we come from. And one question we've asked is, which one is true? And over the previous weeks in this series, we've actually looked at that. We've looked at at the evidence of science and the evidence of nature. And and we said, okay, which one is is more consistent with the truth? And, And what I think we've seen is the evidence of science is far more consistent with the story of creation and it is very much in disagreement, really challenging the story of Darwin's, Darwin's evolution. Now, as we now come and we look more deeply into these first chapters of Genesis, it's, it's vital to see that why we're doing this is because it's a vital issue, foundational issue, because it addresses the most foundational questions of life. You know, who are we? Where do we come from? What is the purpose of life? It's not just a scientific question of origin or even a religious question. It's a question about ultimate truth. Ultimate truth about what we believe, because what we believe about the origin of the world will impact what we think about everything in life. Because both creation and evolution are in a sense comprehensive worldviews. 
And both try to answer the ultimate questions in life. Both try to explain ultimate reality, what existed before everything else. With Darwinism, well, it's matter and and natural causes. And and creation says, no, that in the beginning there was an all-powerful, self-existent God. And this all-powerful, all-purposeful, loving God created and designed not only the heavens and the earth, but specifically humans. And again, what we believe about that will define everything that we understand in life. And so this morning, we're looking specifically at how do we understand humanity? Darwinism says that we are the accident of nature. We're the result of unguided process through natural selection. The Bible says that we were created by God in his image, that each person is an image bearer of God. Now, this is a huge issue. And and I'll point it out even by just asking a really basic question. In our culture, we talk a lot about uh, human rights and civil rights. And well, what is the basis for human worth? What is the basis for any meaning or for any sense of any kind of rights? See, if you think about it, evolution you know, teaches that human beings are the result of natural causes. In our evolutionary past, we literally started out as slime. You know, we were, we were just, I mean, that's what we were. And somehow through luck and forces of nature, we evolved to our present state. And, and, and how did we do that? Well, the law was survival of the fittest so that the strong wins out at the expense of the weak. Now, let me ask you, what does that teach about the value of human life? Why is there any value? And not only that, but if if we evolve through the survival of the fittest, why should the strong take care of the weak? What purpose is there? What what reason is there to to care for the needy in our community, for the hurting, for the, the handicap? Now, to illustrate even the implications of this, let me share a, a quote, a couple quotes I will this morning. But one, this one was from a guy, uh, Dr. William Provine. And before his death, he was a professor at biological sciences at Cornell University. And he was considered a, one of the leading experts on evolution. And he referred to himself as an honest atheist, meaning that he said, well, I'm, I believe in atheism, and I'm going to be honest about the implications, what it really means. And a number of years ago, he was a featured speaker at the annual uh, Darwin Day uh, at University of Tennessee, and in his speech, this is kind of the summation of his opening words in the, in the, uh, um, in the official uh, um, transcript. Here, here's what he said. He said, naturalistic evolution has clear consequences that Darwin, is, Darwin uh, understood perfectly. Number one, there are no gods worth having. Basically saying, if we are the revolt, any god that we have is something that we create in our own mind. Two, no life after death exists. We, you know, we die, that's it. There's nothing beyond this life. Three, no ultimate foundation for ethics exists. Why is anything right or wrong? There's no foundation to say anything is right or wrong. Four, no ultimate meaning in life exists. Why? Because we die, that's the end of life. There's nothing bigger than us. And five, human free will is non-existent. That we're just the result of these natural processes. And so when you look at this, you say, here's what the problem is. If you believe in an evolutionary worldview, What is the basis for human worth? What is the basis for any human rights? Why does human human life have any value? Why are we more valuable than a cow or a bug? You know, why? Because we're all the product of the same evolutionary process. What makes us distinct? Are there any innate human rights? And if we have rights, where do they come from? And what Will Provine is pointing out here is that, no, if you believe in evolution, if you're honest about being an atheist, there is no reason for that. See, but the Bible teaches that this is a false view. We are not the result of evolution. Man was created by God as the culmination of his created work. Man alone is unique in that we're created by God in his image. Again, the Bible's clear. That's what sets us apart from the rest of creation, from the rest of the animal world. We're created in the image of God. We're given an eternal soul. Again, we see this taught right in the beginning of Genesis because it's so foundational. We read a moment ago, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then he said, let us have, give them dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens. So we're given dominion over the world. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, what that means. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Every single human being has incredible worth and value because we are are created in the image of God. Everyone has rights that come from that value. 
The identity and worth is the same for all people, regardless of race, regardless of, of um, ability or disability, regardless of IQ, regardless of, of what we contribute to the culture. Everyone has that intrinsic value. Even those that we might, the culture might say, well, well they don't have anything to offer. They're mentally uh, limited or the unborn who are hidden from God or the people that people will write off. No, everyone has value because we're made in the image of God. See, many in our culture struggle with that. And there's a struggle and a disagreement because they believe in an evolutionary worldview. And so, again, if you believe in that, what is the value? Why are we different than any animal? Again, another quote that I'll give you, a guy named Peter Singer. He's a well-known philosopher at Princeton University, and he focuses on moral philosophy and teaching morality. But he's a materialist, so how do you teach morality if you're a materialist and an atheist? He teaches that some animals actually possess more capacity than some human beings. So you have smart animals who have more capacity than some, some limited uh, humans. And from his perspective, what he's saying is that smart animal has more right to live than a dumb human, in a sense, or a limited human. He takes it to the point where he talks about not only the elite, he argues for the legality of abortion, but he argues that we should consider infanticide when you have children that have limited abilities because, because they don't have value. Again, a smart pig is of greater value than, than, a, than a handicapped human. Now, this is a guy that argues for animal rights at the same time. Um, he argues that humans, you know, some toddlers shouldn't be recognized as humans, but we should look at some intelligent animals and treat them with humanity. He said, he said this, he said, there's no reason to say that humans have more worth and moral status than animals. That's the status, that's what flows from evolution. And so this is an important issue. And we've got to realize that we've got to argue for the fact that we are not just the product of chance, that we are distinctively different. Usually they're saying, well, we're raising up animals, it's really lowering humanity. Now, the Bible teaches that each one of us are created in God's image. What does that mean? Well, let me give you three things that it means. Number one, it means that we are created with an eternal soul. Several minutes ago, I mentioned Will Provine and in his speech where he talked about the consequences of evolution is that there are, there's no life after death. There's no ultimate meaning in life. Why? Because if this life is all that there is into existence, then, hey, the one who dies with the moist toes wins. You know, the one, you know, grab all the gusto you can because there's nothing beyond our enjoyment of this life. And we can step over people to get there. And, and why is that wrong? But the Bible teaches that, no, we are created by God. We're created in his image. And what that means for starters is that we are created with the ability to know God, the capacity to have a relationship with God. And in that capacity, we're also given an eternal soul. Why? Because God is eternal. You see, he created us as more than just a physical being defined by our biology. He created us with, his, with an image in God in, in a sense that we can know him and that we have, like him, eternal existence. Our, our bodies may die, but our souls live on after death. So we can take, for example, we could go to Genesis 2. And when we have in Genesis 2 a longer description of the creation of mankind, look what we read. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So that he just didn't speak us into existence. He formed out of the dust of the ground in a sense of, of a body that from dust to dust, you know, that we return to dust after we die. But then he breathed into us a breath of life. He breathed into us his image so that we have this eternal soul. We're body soul creatures. We're human, human beings that have the dust of the ground that eventually wear down and die. But the real us is our soul that never dies. I love the description of, of this idea in 2 Corinthians 4. It says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. What is the treasure? We have this eternal, priceless treasure, our souls, that is of priceless value that cannot be taken away in any way, but it's contained in a jar of clay. What is that? That's dirt. And some of us, you know, as we get older, we realize, okay, yeah, we're, this body, it, it's breaking down. It doesn't, I mean, I was reminded of that even this past week where we, I mean, everybody was talking about, come to the baseball game, Pastor Mike's going to go out the first pitch. People wanted to come to see if I would mess it up. You know, and they're saying, okay, can this old guy still get it to the plate? 
And, and I was worried about that. And so, you know, I even got out David early and I said, okay, warm me up, warm up my arm. Well, then it was an hour and a half between when he warmed it up and I went out there and my arm stiffed up again. It gets old, it doesn't work as well. And so, man, I was nervous about it. I got it over the plate, didn't get it at the catcher's mitt. David bailed me out. He said it was a sinker ball that it just dove like the way it's supposed to be. And, and, uh, but, but what happens is, is that we're wearing down. I can't do all the things that I used to do. I, ha- I have this treasure, the soul is in a jar of clay. We're body, soul creatures. Now, even as you think about that, that's what sets us apart from the animal kingdom. One question I get all the time is I get, how about, do dogs go to heaven? And uh, some of you have asked me that. And uh, I know I'm gonna upset some people here, but the dogs do not have souls. They're not created in the image of God. They don't have the capacity to know God. They don't have an eternal soul. You know, through my kid's childhood, we had one dog, uh, Snickers. It was a wonderful dog. When they, they will always associate that one dog as their dog from a childhood. And, and uh, our kids loved her. And, and they were concerned about this question if dogs go to heaven. And so we sat down and I tried to explain to them they don't have an eternal soul. And, and, um, and well... I thought it went well. Later in the week, I come home, and my girls meet me at the door. And, uh, and Christy explained to me, Dad, I was thinking about that, and, and I think you might be wrong. And she's usually the one that told me that I might be wrong about numerous things. And uh, so she's saying, I'm thinking about that, and you might be wrong. What if you're wrong about Snickers going to heaven? So just in case you're wrong, I prayed with Snickers for her to receive Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and then Tiffany chimed in and said, yep, yeah, and after she prayed to receive Jesus, I baptized her. And I'm thinking, I'm glad I wasn't here for that. You know, it's just like, now, now even though that she was prayed and baptized, I, I still don't expect to see Snickers in heaven. Um, now, what we need to realize is that we are given this eternal soul. That makes us unique. But it's not only that we have this eternal soul, we're also created in God's image in that we are created to reflect his glory, his character. Again, look at Genesis 1.26. If you have your Bibles, we read, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What does it mean that we're created in his image and his likeness? It's clearly not God's physical likeness. I mean, God's a spirit. The Bible's clear about that. He doesn't have a body. So we're not created to look like him. So we're created in his likeness and his character. Now, the Bible teaches that there are some traits that are that are distinctive to God that we couldn't have. God is self-existent, self-eternal, that God is all-powerful and he's all-present. All we could never be like God in that way. But there are some other traits, theologians, I'll give you a big word, that they'll talk about his communicable attributes. They're attributes that God communicates to us so that we receive them at least in part. And so they are things like his ability to have deep relationships, Moral attributes like love and goodness and kindness and truthfulness. They're all part of God's character that he's given to us, at least in part. And we're called to now be in God's image and reflect that character, to try to be like God. Now, think of it this way. If I were to take a canvas and say, okay, I want to paint a picture of you. Does that have a good reflection? And you might be, no, I've seen you can't draw a stick figure. No, okay, okay, it would not be a good reflection if I did it. But let's say if you had a good artist paint a picture of you. Okay, what you want to know, is it, a, is it a good reflection? Does it look like you? Is somebody able to look at this picture a couple hundred years from now and, and say, that's an accurate representation of what that person looked like? Well, what God talks about here when we're in his image, it's that idea, but not physically, but, but in character. God's in a sense saying, I created you as human beings to reflect my glory, to reflect my goodness and my love and my character and my relationship. I've created you like a canvas that I've painted on, or I've created you like a mirror that I want you to reflect back to me my character. And if you're reflecting my character properly, you will be happier. You will flourish, and and the world around you will flourish. Well, why? Why? Because when I reflect God's character, I'm created in God's image. And the more that I become like God in character, the more I reflect him, the more I'm actually being the person whom God has created me to be. I'm aligning myself with the nature of my true true creation. And not only that, but the more I do it, the more people are blessed because I'm now a vehicle by which God brings his goodness and grace into the world. So we're created to reflect him But in reflecting him, we also need to realize that we are spiritually dependent in that reflection. And and what I mean by that is this. If we are created in God's image, 
then our identity and our purpose come from God. They're directly related to him. And if we lose our relationship with God, then we cut off the source of our identity and our meaning. Now again, think about this. I mentioned like the idea that we reflect his image, like a mirror. All right, if we are created to reflect God in his image, his glory, think about a mirror. Can a mirror produce an image by itself? No, if you hold a mirror up to nothing, what you get is nothing. And for you to be able to see the right image in the mirror, you've got you've to receive an image from outside of the mirror. And so when God says, I've created you in my image, that means that I need to be focused on Christ. I need to see God to be able to reflect him accurately. And if I'm not, what happens is I'm actually cut off from the sense of who, who I really am. See, even when we talk about reflecting God's glory, you could say glory is a word of importance. God is glorious in that he's all important. And when we're told that we're made in the image of God and we're called to reflect his glory, it means that you can't generate your own importance. I can't try to do this and somehow say, well, I'm important because what I've done. No, we have incredible value and worth, but it isn't from ourselves. It isn't by our accomplishment. It's, it's, it's being rooted in our relationship with God. Now, now, what's that mean? So we kind of dealt with some theology, but let's make it practical. What are some practical ideas of First of all, starting understanding God's image and practically how it impacts how we view ourselves and how we view, view others. I mean, there's a crisis in our culture, especially amongst the youth, about not only oppression, but identity and self-worth. And I think a lot of it is actually rooted to this issue. I mean, you have schools that will say, well, because it's a problem, we have counseling programs. And, and so you have kids that will go into the counselor and they say, well, you're valuable, you're worthy, you're, you know, you've got to believe this. And then they go into science class and they'll tell them, well, actually, you just are the result of accident of nature, that you were once on lucky slime. There is no purpose. There is no design in life. There's no, there's no greater purpose. So I'm telling you, you're valuable, but why? And are we, are, should we be confused that our kids are confused, that they struggle? It all it goes, it grows from this. See, what is, when we talk about self-image, is it important? Yes, it's vital. But what is the basis for our self-image? If you believe in evolution, what is the basis for any sense of self-worth and value? There is none. But on the other hand, if you're created by God as the culmination of God's work of creation, if he's put his image inside of you, you have incredible value. A lot of t- passages in the Bible teach this, but one that I love is in Psalm 139. Look what David says. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's wombs. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. He's saying basically I have great value because God has given it to me. You have great value because God has designed you. It's the culmination of his creation. Now all of us, we might look at it and say, but you don't know my failings. You don't know my weaknesses. And God says, no, I do. That's part of who I designed you to do. But, but, but you des- I designed you so that you have incredible worth and value, just the way you are. And then you might look at it and say, well, these are my weaknesses. These are my failings. These are the, where I messed up. These are my scars. And God's saying, yes, I've designed you. And part of that is to teach you to rely on me so that you are even more beautiful. You are more of whom I called you to be. See, we need to realize that there isn't one of us that God's doing the work of creation and saying, I'm creating this person, and then, and then he creates, he's created somebody, and he says, oh, oh, oops, you know, my mind, my mind wandered on that one, let me, you know. There isn't any of us that that's true. Some of us might feel it's true, but that's not true for any of us. Now, with each person, God finishes his creation, he unveils his design, and he said, it's good. I'm proud of what I've done. I couldn't do better. You know, what's interesting is when you look at what David is saying here, he's doing it in the context of praising God. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. See, what he's saying here is that my understanding of my identity is rooted in my understanding and the value of God. Why? Because if God is really great, if God is great and powerful, and, and then he said, okay, this is the highlight of my, of my creation, then I must be of great value. Why? Because God is the greatest artist. If you, if you have in a sense of, you think of the greatest artist, if, you, you know, if Michelangelo was here and he said, okay, I'm going to invest myself and I'm going to do the, my greatest work of art and he unveils it, well, it's a masterpiece because it's done by a master artist. Is there intrinsic value in the oil or the paint? No. 
The value is out of the greatness of the artist. And that's what David is teaching here. Our understanding of our value is directly related to our view of God and his greatness. And he realizes that man is of incredible creation because God is the great creator who has put himself literally into creation. Even sometimes in our culture, we would say, man, if you say that you're valuable, well, that's conceited. And how can you say that you're important or how... Well, if you understand even what David is saying here, how could he say, you know, you know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? You're, you know, how can he say that? It's not based on any personal conceit, but based on the greatness of God. See, if I'm totally convinced of the goodness and power and sovereignty of God, then the only conclusion I can come to is what conclusion David comes to here is God saying, you are my work of creation. I couldn't have done a better job. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that you are God's design, that that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are created in God's image, that God's proud of you? It's not only what we need to believe about ourselves, it's what we need to believe about others as we interact with them as well. See, when we think about other people, we need to realize that everyone we work with has and deal with has incredible value, not based on what they do or who they, you know, what they perform or how smart they are or popularity or wealth or but they have value based on God's image. In his book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis talked about this in a powerful way. And he started off by saying, you've never talked to a mere mortal. There are no ordinary people. You know, you look at this, there's no one that's just a person. Every person has a divine soul. Every person has incredible value. There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations and cultures and arts, civilizations, all these are mortal. And their life is to ours is the life of the gnat. All the things that we think about what's happening in our country and all that, all those things are nothing compared to the eternal soul. But it is immortals with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. It's immortals, everyone, if we understood the true value. You see, we would not only see them differently, but we would then treat them differently. That's why we talk about these things. It's so important, not only the value of, of, that's that's why special needs ministry, trying to build that is so important because every person has great value. That's why abortion is wrong because the Bible teaches that every person has a soul, has an image of God, even the unborn. That's why euthanasia is wrong. Our culture is gonna say, well, they've lived past their, you know, being able to contribute to the culture, but their value isn't based on what they contribute. It's based on the image of God. Now, if we understand that, we also understand this is the basis for any human and civil rights. So again, we live in our culture, we talk about that a lot. But if we are the product of evolution, what is the basis of any human rights, of any civil rights? There is none. Because there's no intrinsic value to humanity, and there's no one outside of humanity to actually tell us about those rights. So increasingly, when our culture talks about rights, what's happening is that the sense of human rights are really more an issue of power. Who has the position of power and who can now demand the rights because they have power? And so it's not something intrinsic. It's actually a power thing. That's what's behind things like critical race theory. It's a special rights that people are trying to achieve through power and through influence and lifting some people up and other people down. But if we're created in God's image, then we have to realize that all people are given worth and value by God and we're given rights by him. The rights that belong to each person simply because we are people created in God's image. And the role of anyone in power, the role of government is to to create rights or to give rights. It's to recognize the rights that God has given. That was at the core of our Declaration of Independence. In Declaration of Independence, what does it say? All men, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. It's basically saying they're created in the image of God. They're equal. And because we're created in the image of God, that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That that amongst these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And the role of government is to recognize the image of God, to recognize the rights that are deserving because of that image of God that each person has. Now, you can see it's important, not only what we think about ourselves and other people, but even also how we treat other people, how we act towards others. Because again, the Bible teaches this principle that all human life has great value because each person bears the image of God and is therefore worthy not only of being thought highly of, but treating highly of. But what's the problem? In our culture, 
when we don't see this, we tend to judge people not based on who they are internally, but externals. You know, what they, you know, externals, have they done certain things to earn our kindness? Do they have special abilities that somehow we should see them more as, you know, as, as more valuable? And it's not a new problem at all. It's something that is part of human nature. The only thing that changes is how, you know, different cultures judge and what, what standard we judge. And even within the church, it can creep in. In James chapter 2, there's a, uh, you know, James confronted the church based on this whole idea that we were, the church was doing this. He starts off, he says, my brother, show no partiality as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And when he says show no partiality, it could literally be translated, brother, stop receiving the face. It, it has a unique word that means, you know, don't judge on external factors. And, and, and it, it's actually an idea that we translate into our modern idiom of don't judge on face value. And he's saying, don't judge on face value. That's what you're doing. You're, even in the church, you're doing this. But instead, what should we do? It says, don't show no partiality as you hold to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And here's what I want you to see. This is the Lord of glory. That's the key. Because what he's saying here is when we look at this, the core issue that helps us over, overlook and overcome prejudice, you know, overcome you know, judging on face value, is seeing the glory of Christ. Now, here's the problem. Let me show you how it plays out. Next verses. For if a man comes wearing, uh, wearing a gold ring and a fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now here's what he's saying, is when you have, you come in, is, is that people, if we're not overwhelmed with God's glory, people come in and we're overwhelmed by people's glory. Where in a sense, we're saying, okay, you know, here's somebody that's wealthy, that's powerful, that has influence, that, well, and here's somebody that has no glory, so we're going we're gonna to treat, we're going to notice them, and we're going to overlook them. Now, how do we have a proper perspective? How do we stop? By looking at the Lord's glory. By recognizing that all of us have God's glory. Let me even think of it this way. You know, if I say I've got a couple of uh, flashlights here, okay, so let's say if I've got a flashlight, and, and, and if, especially if we're in a dark room, I'm trying to this flashlight, and you'd say, okay, this, meh. You know, I'm not the brightest bulb on the shelf. Okay, that's, we, we know, okay, this, but it's a way, you know, but then you get somebody come, else come in and they've got, man, this one is a whole lot brighter. This room really shines. And, 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 but maybe you've got somebody else come in and says, okay, well, this guy, I mean, this is like newfangled flashlight. This is, I mean, that's really special because that's different. And suddenly we're tended because this shines and this doesn't, you overlook the one that's kind of dull. Now, that's more true if we're in a dark room, isn't it? The darker the room, the more you're drawn toward the brightness of the light. And here's the key. What if we go outside on a sunny day? What if I go outside and I start shining my, even if I got the brightest light possible, and I say, hey, look at my light, look at how bright it is. If you're outside on a sunny day, you don't even notice the flashlight. Why? Because the brightness of the sun. It's so bright that it overshines anything else. If it's dark, we notice this. And here's what James is saying. He's saying, as believers, we need to be focused on the brightness of the sun, on who Christ is. We need to be overwhelmed by his glory. And if we're overwhelmed with his glory, what happens? You're going to have somebody come in and say, look at how bright I am. And goes, we don't even notice it. And it's not only the glory in Christ, but it's then also the glorious image in each person. Because it's not only who Christ is, but understanding that we are created in his image. So I will look at each person and say, that person has value. That person is significant. And whether they come in and they're dressed and they're wealthy and they're fancy and they have power and influence, or whether they are, you know, have nothing by the worldly standards, ultimately, everyone has the ultimate value. Why? Because, because the glory is the sun. The glory is the sun that's reflecting out of us. We should be blinded by that. It doesn't mean that we you know, don't treat anybody well. It's we treat everyone well. Because everyone is brighter than we could ever imagine. Not only that, but when we think of the gospel. The gospel where Jesus loved each person enough that he died for him and that he saves us and he makes us God's children. That should break down every barrier. That's what Paul talks about in Colossians. Where he says, here there is no Greek and no Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Christ is all and in all. And he's saying because of the gospel, it's all about God. It's all about the God in us that we see. 
It's not based on the rule keeping and the good person and the bad person or slave or free. It's not economic status. It's not income or net worth. It's not male or female. It's not based on gender or race. That every person has in, not only equal value, incredible value, incredible worth. And when we understand this, this should then be translated into our action. Because we not only see each other with great value, but we then treat each other, we relate to each other according to the true worth that they have. You know, great passage, it teaches us ideas in Matthew 25. It's often referred to as the, you know, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And, and Jesus is talking about the last judgment. And he says that he's going to divide out people from, you know, the sheep who followed him and the goats who didn't. And, and um, look what he says about this division and how he divides then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so he comes on and he says, okay, this is what sets us apart. And then he can contrast that with the goats on the other side. And he said, okay, the problem was when I came and I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was needy, you weren't there for me. And, and, and they objected and they said, Jesus, when did we ignore you? And basically, they're saying, Jesus, if, if you were there, we would have loved you. If, you. if we knew it was you, we would have, of course, we would have done anything for you because you're of great value. But his response to them in verse 45, he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now, what he's saying is every person that you interact with is created in my image and therefore has my value and worth in them. As you do it unto them, you do it unto me, because I'm in them. Now, the problem with the people that Jesus called the goats wasn't that they mistreated people or abused them. It's that they overlooked them and they ignored their need. And the reason that they overlooked them and ignored their need was because they didn't see them as valuable. Again, what's the difference between the sheep and the goats? It wasn't just their behavior. It was their belief and motivation behind the behavior. See, the second group didn't see the people as valuable. And then what they come and they said, Jesus, if it were you, of course we would do that because you're important. You're valuable. Of course we would love you. And he says, I was there. See, it, it, when you, again, when, when we go back and said, what set the right people apart? He said, as you did it as to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. What set them apart was they saw the value in people. They saw the glory and I think what Jesus is saying is not, well, just as you interact with people, just pretend it's Jesus. I've heard people say that. You know, well, when you see that homeless person, pretend it's Jesus. And if they were Jesus, what would you do to them? If you, if you see the handicapped person, pretend it's Jesus. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is don't pretend. What he's saying is understand they have my image. They are my image bearers. So when you see them, see me, see me in them because they are created in my image and they have all the value that I have because that's who I've made them to be. And since my, they bear my image, my worth and identity on them, treat them as you would treat me. It's not just pretending, it's actually acting in a way that is a basis of what we believe. My friends, you see how important this is? Well, let me just wrap it up by asking a couple questions, just practical questions, you know, taking this home, applying it to your own life. The first, is it a matter of what we believe, first of all, about ourselves? And so the question I'd ask, do you believe that you are created in God's image, that you're created as his masterpiece? Do you believe that? And there might be some here that are, you know, here you're online and you're watching, you're saying, but God doesn't want anything to do with me. I've rejected him. I've done this. No, God loved you so much, and you are of such value that even while we sinned, even as you rejected God, God sent his son to die for you on the cross because you're that valuable to him. Do you understand how important and valuable you are? And you might look at that and say, but I've messed up here, and I've got these scars, and God could never amuse me. And God says, no, I want to redeem all those things. 
I can take everything in your past, even where you've messed up, even the scars that you have. I've been sovereign and I want to redeem that. And so that I'm going to use not just, not because you're you know, who you are by yourself, but who you are in me. And I didn't create you and then say, whoops. I didn't mess up and, and nor did you mess up what I created. Do you understand how valuable you are? That you are a masterpiece. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Just the way that you are, that God is proud of you. Do you know what it means to live up to that? To live into that? That's why I want to encourage you to do. Believe that about yourself. And if you can't, say, God, help me to believe it. Because it's vital that you do. One more question. Who's difficult for you in your life? You don't want me to go there, right? Okay, everybody's got, you've got somebody in your mind right off the bat. Who's difficult in your life? What would it look, for, look like for you to treat that person as someone who bears the image of God? You see, because if I think about, you know, people that are easy in my life, I can treat them kindly based on the externals. Based on what they give to me or what I think they might give to me. What sets us apart is that we love our enemies. What sets us apart is that we care for people that have nothing to offer us. What sets us apart in believing this is that we see the value of people, not only the people that have something to offer externally, but the people who don't. Even the people that are difficult and that are harder, that might treat, mistreat us, or, or people that, that have nothing to offer. People that our culture might look at and overlook and not see as valuable. Well, let me ask you, who are the, who's that difficult person for you in your life? And we all can think of somebody. God's pointing them out in your mind. What would it look like for you to treat that person as someone who bears the image of God? And it might start by you just coming and saying, God, help me. I don't know how to do that. Help me to see that image. Because it's not just pretending, but it literally starts by seeing things differently. God, help me to see the value of who they are as an image bearer. Then help me to treat them as I would treat Jesus. And I want to tell you, if we learn to do this, man, it's a battle. It's not easy. I understand that. But if we learn to do this, it will change us. It will change our view of those around us. It will change our spirit. And it will be used of God to change others and change our culture as well. This is practical stuff. It's not easy, but it's practical. And I hope and pray that as you reflect on this this week, not only about who God has made you to be, but seeing the worth and the value of others and living that out and treating them as an image bearer of God, that God will do an amazing thing in our lives, in us, and through us. If you have a question about the message, Community Church or Jesus Christ, send us a text to 330-400-3242. You can learn more about our events and community groups at ccpl.life slash connect. There you can also send in a prayer request. We would love to pray for you. Have a blessed Lord's Day, and we'll see you on Sunday.